Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I am Audrey Bilger. I'm president of Reed College, and I'm delighted to be with you today for our virtual reunions. It's an annual tradition that we have these reunions, and usually we're on campus, um, maybe with a, a nice cold beverage and talking to one another. We'll get there again. But um, in the meantime, I just want to say, I know this is not an ideal format. We really just wanted to share with you some of how this, this most unusual of years has gone. And um, I, I am just really glad that you're here to be able to participate. I want to say that last week we had a really successful alumni college um, last weekend from June 4th to 6th. Uh, the, the, the alumni college theme this year was warming signs, emergency adaptation, and innovation. And it honored the 10th year anniversary of the development of the environmental studies major at Reed. Um, at the session last week, 16 alumni experts from various disciplines and industry offered nine lectures over three days to over 150 alumni who joined from all over the world for intellectual conversations on this critical subject. Some of the topics included the history of climate change, regulation, green investments, renewable energy, technology, urban heat islands, the legacy of redlining, climate research, resiliency planning, wildfire science, oceanography, and much more. It was a really great uh, event, and, and I hope that some of you were able to be part of it. To give you a sense of what we're doing today, usually at reunions, we would gather on the Friday of the big weekend to officially welcome Reedies back to campus. This year, we're gathered in this virtual space to take an adv advantage of this opportunity to share updates on what life has been like here on campus over the past year. I'm here with my colleagues, as well as Darlene Pachetsny, class of 2001, who's a trustee. Darlene will be moderating the session in just a few minutes. To get us rolling, um, I, I, um, we we're going to share with you uh, this, this evening a video to sum up what the year was like. And um, I find this um, inspirational. And so um, please enjoy a video. I have found that students come to read because they want to explore. They come because they want to figure out a lot of big things. And this was a year when there was much to figure out. The biggest thing that I believe we all found our way to was finding the sense of connection. With the uncertainty of these times, academics are a sphere where growth and curiosity and kernels of excitement are still possible. I'm especially appreciative of professors who've really centered accessibility in their teaching this year. And I think that that's really demonstrated a certain degree of care. The emphasis on equity and the emphasis on access to everyone is really important here at Reed. Getting to understand other people's life stories, like that's what makes this place so unique and special and what makes learning really important because we can all bring a different piece of our stories into the classroom. Students, our faculty, our staff come from so many places and the experiences that they have and the, the opportunities to engage in deep conversations, deep learning, that's what makes this place awesome. There is an emphasis on critical thinking and an emphasis on being able to come to conclusions logically for yourself. Debate never seems like it's hostile, it's always very productive. Just being able to walk through campus and just know that if I tripped, someone would help me up. And to know that if I had a question, I could ask anyone and they'd be willing to help me. I just love being in that community and to have that feeling around me of that I'm supported and that I can support anyone else. There is like that specific magic to having a read education. I feel like I've been able to join communities where I feel really valued and heard and able to explore who I am, while also having an education in the classroom that allows me to really dive into the topics I'm interested in. 
What's been hard is that for a lot of seniors, we've had to sort of prematurely say goodbye to a lot of read traditions that have really been formative for the past couple of years. Certain things have remained, you know, a sunny Friday on the lawn feels like a holiday, feels a little bit like magic. You know, I do have a certain degree of enduring faith in the Reed student body's capacity for shenanigans. I really see in the ways that Reed has made it through a complicated time that we are prepared to unite and stand by one another. These are the kinds of elements that we will carry forward into the future, and I'm really proud of the Reed community. I feel enormously grateful for the group of friends that I found, and in general, just the environments of my classrooms. I'm also proud of myself for working hard and for growing into myself in a bigger way. I mean, maybe that's just a matter of this time in life, but I, don't, I can't imagine it without Reed. All right, welcome everyone. We'll get started. My name is Darlene Pashechny, um, class of 2001 is Audrey mentioned, and I'm a uh, trustee, also on the alumni board, and um, active with some of our alumni initiatives, like the Read Legal Network and the Read Career Coaches, all of which, if you don't know anything about, check out the website. Uh, the Read Alumni pages, lots of information there, um, and I hope you've been hearing about those alumni uh, activities throughout this week. I'm so pleased to moderate this panel. For the first 30 minutes, uh, I'm going to be asking a set of questions for our panelists, and then we're going to open it up to Q&A from the audience, which um, you can uh, submit questions through the chat feature. Uh, staff is going to help tabulate those questions and kind of organize, so I'm not trying to do too many things at once. Um, we'll have 20 minutes or so at the end and try to address as many of your questions as possible within the time that we have. Now. This year has been something really special. Um, I just love the quote from the video we heard about the Reed student body's capacity for shenanigans still persevering throughout this time. I imagine our alumni community has maintained our capacity for shenanigans and perseverance. Um, to give you a sense of more of what it's been like on campus, um, just in a couple of minutes, I think one or two minutes, I'm gonna be introducing each of our panelists and ask them to share an anecdote, just something from uh, their experience on campus this year to get us going. So first we'll start with Audrey, Audrey Bilger, president of Reed College. And Audrey, before you start, I gotta say, I'm gonna give a gift to our audience. This You gave me this gift when one of your first uh, presentations on campus when you introduced yourself and um, explained that the pronunciation of your name, the G is hard, but fair. <laughs> and I just love that. I wish I had something similar for my name, but, but that's a fabulous way to introduce yourself. So Audrey, what, what anecdote can you share with us? Thank you so much, Darlene. Well, as, um, as, as some of you may know, I've, I've enjoyed very much um, being able to see people on campus, masks and all, but um, I, I find myself often uh, going up to students and soliciting conversations and sometimes startling them um, because you know they're on their way. One, one morning I I was talking to a student and they're like, I got a gift. I'm like, fine, fine, fine. But um, I think one of the more amusing things that happened to me this year and my um, and my eagerness to to uh, get to talk with students and ask them how they're doing and find out how the year is going is uh, a, an afternoon when I was walking over from uh, from the the student union toward Elliott Hall. I saw a student under a tree on their laptop and I thought, oh, gonna go say hi. And so I, I walked over to approach the student and as I got closer, I could see, okay, headphones, well, you know, hi. And then she was like, I'm in class. It's like, okay, this is the world that we're in now. Uh, but it was, I will say one of the greatest pleasures 
early on um, in the semester was seeing students coming back to campus. Um, some of the first year students were clearly blinking in, in, and, and grateful to be out of their parents' living rooms. And so it was, it was quite the year. Fantastic. All right, Hugh Porter, Vice President for College Relations and Planning. Hugh, you've had an easy name, so I'm not even gonna make something up for you. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, hi, everybody. I'm really uh, sorry not to be able to see you in person. Uh, I see names I know pop up on the screen. So um, hello to you all. Um, you know, my role has been uh, completely turned upside down this year. Um, last summer, summer of 2020 was just a time of enormous uncertainty, um, uh, real fear. Um, and I was in the middle with Kathy of co-chairing, Kathy Olson, who's going to speak in a minute, of co-chairing the COVID risk assessment group and trying to figure out how we could launch uh, the semester. A particular challenge was COVID testing. And COVID testing is uh, the Wild West of the scientific community, as far as I'm concerned. Um, it was then, and to some degree is now, um, high price and uh, low returns are the risk. We had identified a good vendor, um, a reputable company. They had relationships with other colleges. Um, fortunately, we opened up some sort of test testing with a few people in early August and the lab had overcommitted and they, they took them more than a week to get test results back. Um, and that made the, the relationship basically useless. So we were in real crisis. Um, and through a series of connections, I found a person who manages testing for major league baseball. And he's the one who connected us with our test vendor, overnighted 9,000 COVID tests, and we were able to get the semester started. Um, it was a crazy summer. Wow, Reed and major league baseball. Never thought I'd hear <laughs> that connection. Okay, moving on, Kathy Olson. Uh, Kathy's the Dean of the Faculty and also a professor of psychology. Hey, Kathy, what's Hi, your thanks. anecdote for us? Thanks, Darlene. When I was thinking back on the year, I mean, I, the thing that struck me, I think, was, was seeing people on campus. I guess I have two really tiny stories. I, this one day, I remember I was walking kind of behind, uh, you know, so my office is in Elliott Hall. I was walking behind the building. There was these tents, and someone was saying, hey, Kathy. Hi, Kathy. And I just, they had a baseball cap on, and they had their mask on, and I just was like, hi. Like, I, I really didn't know who it was. And then it was... Um, Tony Palomino, and he just like pulled up his mask and his hat and he said, it's Tony. And then he put it back on, you know, like got safe, you know, got safe again. And that's just that feeling of like, you couldn't quite tell who people were, but you, but you would see them on campus. For me, I, the other thing I was thinking of is there's a lot of people, again, I was new in my role this year and I would meet a lot of people only on Zoom. So then I would run into them on campus. And, um, and many of you probably have this experience. I would be surprised, like, you're much shorter than I thought or much taller than I thought. I mean, there was someone, I again, a new faculty member who I'd only met on Zoom and talked to a number of times, delightful new faculty member. And I would, I saw her in the in commons and she came up and said, hi, hi, Kathy. And I was like, oh, oh, hi. And I kind of that realizing that I didn't really know what this person looked like in person. We've now actually sat out on the, the red chairs on the front lawn and I've run into this faculty member a number more times on campus. But that sort of feeling of, everybody looks the same size in Zoom and then you see them in person and they actually look bigger or smaller than, than you imagined that they were, so. It's kind of exciting. It's like spotting your favorite TV star and on the street, walking down. Exactly, you can only know them. Exactly. <laughs> All right, uh, and finally, Carnell McConnell-Black, who is our Vice President for Student Life. Hey, Carnell. Hello, how are you? Well, it's it's great to 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 be here and to be able to chat with folks today. Um, so it's so interesting you say you know mine is always about the students. So I would just articulate that. And you know, folks always say you you know you give stories. I love telling stories. I'm a storyteller in general. It's just the, that's my nature. But one of the things that I found to be um, um, to be really great about our community um, this past year, at least for me, it was kind of like a, a glimmer of, of campus life, was that I got a chance to connect with more students in person than I actually imagined um, I would have in this this past year. Um, and uh, similar to Kathy, in a sense, it was like I had I, I met with some students for obviously virtually, 
but and this is i had a student that I, I had been meeting with regularly all year long and it wasn't until we got to the very end of the of the academic year that i finally met the student in person and it was that moment where you're like having just having a normal conversation because you feel like you've known them now for a while and then as we were getting ready to go i was like hold up this is the first time we're meeting in person and you know everybody does the happy dance and you know really <laughs> excited and um and so those were the like those were my glimmering moments uh, throughout the course of um uh of the year where i was just really excited to just connect in person with students and yeah. i think students were really uh, excited too when they got a chance to actually talk in person versus having the virtual format um, that we've been living with. So yeah, that's, that's kind of like my my sense. And, and I think that got, a, a, again, a, get a little bit more glimpse of like folks longing for this sense of connection outside of a computer screen. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. We're going to jump into some questions now. Kathy, why don't you start us off? Um, could you share a couple examples of how the academic program uh, was presented this year, both in person and, and online or both? Yeah, thanks, Darlene. Um, yeah, I mean, there were a variety of ways the program kind of as Darlene's noting, um, some stuff was in person, some stuff was online, some stuff was a combination of things. Um, and as Carnell just noted, I think everything we did, we were trying to sort of still figure out ways to maintain this connection, this, um, keeping it very intellectually rich. How do we kind of do that with these different kinds of um, modes that we're doing instruction in? So for me, I guess I would just say, I was just amazed at the creativity that faculty brought to this. So just to give a few, just tiny examples. Um, I mean, people came up with ways. So if you looked at the arts, for instance, we have chorus that's being taught online because you can't bring people together and sing in person because that's mm. particularly dangerous. So you've got chorus being taught online you've got theater production. So there was Rhinoceros in the fall that was done. That was amazing where you, you watched it and it looked like it was in person, but it was clear they were kind of doing funny things where they had people in different spaces so that they could create this seemingly something that looked in person, but it was something that was done online. The dance department, they um, had had studios where there were people that were dancing in person, they had people that were dancing in their rooms. And so they had this whole elaborate kind of new cameras put in and everything so they could do this hybrid that was just to still give people that experience of being in a dance class you could look at the natural sciences so um, some of them were physically distanced with masks so you had biology labs that were happening in person you had some labs that were happening online so in many departments they got special kinds of um, uh, materials where they could actually do something where somebody was using some technology online um, wanted to highlight there was a class um, that did field research where they did a they went on they went out into the field um, so Aaron Ramirez's class and they you know so half the class would go out on these field trips they would do them kind of every other week the other half of the class they had a 360 degree camera that showed them what they were doing in the field so they're you know doing this field this environmental work um, so they could try to experience it in that way so I mean to me it was like okay we we still want people to have that really in-depth experience that really rigorous experience um we can't do it with everybody so let's bring half of them at a time and uh, as hugh noted i co-chaired the covid risk assessment group and so we're getting these proposals of like they're going to be in the van and they're separated in these ways and really thinking creatively to make sure that students still had that challenging rigorous experience that we wanted to have mm -hmm. so. so with with these innovations and brainstorming and new ideas i mean as we transition to more in-person, do you, do you see continuing some of these new techniques and new, um, uh, you know, wonderful things that have come out of necessity, right. how can that be implemented going forwards and lessons learned and, and utilizing those tools going forward um, as we move more to in-person? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I guess I, I do not see us becoming a remote campus where we're going to be like now doing that's not that's not the plan. But to me, our you know our toolbox is bigger now. We actually have stuff that we didn't know how to do before. So um, I was meeting, I had kind of office hours on Friday afternoon with faculty members and a bunch of language professors came by and they were talking about how they had faculty member they had colleagues at other places around the world that would zoom into a class and they said next year I'm going to be in person, but every once in a while I will have some Friday, will we bring in somebody from 
France or whatever, and we will have a Zoom session and we'll actually will be able to do this. So we now have technology to bring in some guest speaker that we wouldn't have experienced before. Um, the uh, faculty member is at a conference. They could actually have office hours and they could just say, we're gonna have a Zoom office hours this week. I'm, I'm traveling in, in New Orleans this week, but yet I can actually do office hours. So before you just would have had to cancel them so we can actually expand what we can do. Um, I think the comfort that people um, again, I'm someone who myself didn't always feel comfortable with technology. And so by necessity, as you noted, I had to learn how to do a number of things. To be honest, I still forget to unmute myself and whatever, but um, I now try a lot more things because we had to get comfortable with technology. So I think faculty are just going to try out more things. So we'll actually have access to that. Um, I guess the final thing I would note is a lot of things we are now more accessible to students. So we've added closed captioning. We've done things that again, we needed to do, but they're just best practices. So now we'll, many of those things, we'll just continue doing that so that we'll have for every student to have some kind of video you're watching that also has closed captioning. Let's just continue that into the future. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Great, thank you. Sure. Carnell, Carnell, this is your first year at Reed. Welcome. <laughs> I know, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> what a year. Um, so, so what have you learned about the student community in this such an unusual year? I mean, how have you found this experience and, and what, what are some of your takeaways? Yes, you know, unusual, I think is an understatement uh, these days. Um, we went through obviously what I would say a double pandemic, you know, we had both the COVID-19, but then we also had the racial unjust in, in our country and our society. Mm -hmm. um, and then on top of that, we had wildfires. And, and so the air quality was, was just first time I've ever seen that before. Um, and ice storms as well. And so, I mean, when I say understatement, I'm like the first year for a lot of our first year students as well was like, wow, okay. Mm -hmm. But I think at the end of the day, when I think about this first year, I think about our students as being very thoughtful. They're very resilient. Um, they care about each other. They're creative. They're inquisitive. Um, but I think most important, what I what I what I found to be um, uh, what I found to be really interesting and unique about our community and about our students is that they care about each other, and that care showed up in lots of different ways. Um, and um, they under they they cared about the impact of all these things on each other, even if it didn't impact them personally. They actually cared about each other in the things that they were going through. Um, and so for me, it, it it was just really great to see that 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 commitment and that conviction of our students to care for each other um, in ways that allowed them to navigate what this year would have been that that this year was like. Um, and um, again, as I said, they did it with grace. They did it with conviction. They did it with 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 um, intent. And um, I think about any other campus that I've ever been on. Um, I don't know if it would have happened the same way. Um, and so I felt privileged to be even part of the community with our students as they nav navigated this 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 unusual year. Um, and I think they they have developed us. Th this group of students have they developed a set of skills that they cannot get anywhere else. Um, and that is, um, I think there's there's some beauty in that as well. Can you give some examples of community building uh, during the last year? Yeah, you know, um, that probably was one of the most challenging things. So mm -hmm. in my role as student life, as you know, as the VP for student life and, and just professionally, our roles are to bring students together. And this pandemic really, regulated how and when and how if we could actually bring them together which again it's a, ch it's a challenge um but i would say that um our student life team really got into the weeds and trying to figure out and getting creative and actually listening to our students about what was going to be helpful what is the the underpinning of some of the things that they found to be really important in building that community because i think we talk about building community but there's some there's some tenets of uh, of that so we did everything from um having things like semester surprise where we had food trucks and things in nature so we tried to figure out any way that we could get people together Everyone has to eat. So that's that's always, uh, I think, goes over well for our students. 
I would also say we did things like um, we, we leveraged the front lawn. I mean, that's an important piece of still building community. Um, but we also got creative with the virtual space too. So whether it was a grab and go event, so we did, um, at the be especially at the beginning of the year, we did a, a handful of grab and go events where students would learn how to have tea, you know, the different types of tea. We did chocolate tasting and we had someone come in and do and tell us about chocolate tasting. Um, um, we did terrariums as well. So we have, we have we've got a chance to build terrariums. Um, so there were some cool things that I got to actually for take in that I hadn't experienced myself. So I, I, it was really great to see students engaged and they're like, can we do this? Can we do another one of these? Can we do? And so some of these things we actually ended up repeating for more students to be able to, uh, to be engaged. Um, another thing that we did was to, to develop actually a weekly student event and programs newsletter. Because I think when you're in person, and at least in my understanding of, of, of the Reed community and our students, they see they see posters. That's how they know about an event or whatnot. And so we actually had a, a, an electronic newsletter that put everything in one place, which made it actually easier for our students to find out what's happening, what's going on. They can invite friends, things of that nature. Um, yeah. But Especially, as I said, you're not walking around campus as much necessarily. Right. Posters, so right. Yeah. Um, so we yeah. have to just again change the ways, the modality of how we're how we're reaching students. Um, and so that was that was I think a really really helpful helpful too. Um, so I, I, you know one of the other things too is that you know competition was really important still. So we you know we try to figure out how do we have competitions and this was something that I think was connected to um, to even uh, like COVID testing for example. And so we wanted to have competitions to get our you know our numbers up in in the residence halls for students doing testing and. It was a way because we knew that if we could get testing up, the halls could open, the you know lounges could open up. So students realized it's like, oh, this is a competition. So let's see if we can. We want to we want to keep our lounge open all year long. So how do we make sure we we get on on track with that? So we we were just trying to get creative with some of this to to make it at least somewhat interesting um, for our students. Um, so yeah, there was a couple things of ways that we kind of created created community. And some of these events were happening in the housing and some in different areas of campus. Yes. So yeah. not only was it in, in you know, in campus housing, but it was also, again, as on the Great Lawn or on the quad. We even did, um, and, and we had tents too. So I'm sure folks probably heard about tents that we had on campus. We had the, we had Earth, Wind and Fire, which were kind of our academic tents. And then we have the, in the quad, we had um we had a big tent where it was kind of like all the where people you know our students would come and have lunch or, or breakfast or meals um in addition to being in inside of commons um but we we had even an election night watch party um and students were able to come together and even in these moments where i talk about building community even when we we're going through such tough times students just actually pre appreciate it be, being able to at least come together and so we were like okay let's figure out how to make it happen um i think i think for us it was just always trying to get to a yes when it came to to getting yeah. students to, to get together still mm -hmm. doing it safely and it our students were phenomenal about it too so mm -hmm. they were doing the testing they were going regularly and, and our residence halls we were twice a week we were we were having students go and test twice a week and students were doing it because they cared about the community and they also wanted to still have some semblance of a college experience for their first year, um, yeah. especially for our first year students, but even our, our continuing students as well. Great. Great. Thanks, Cardell. Yeah. Hugh, I want to ask you, how have operations, college operations changed during this pandemic in, in three minutes. Explain everything. Now, <laughs> what are some of the major things yeah. you'd like to touch on with, with how things have been changing? Sure, I'll, I'll be super quick. I think a lot of you are well informed about this. And I, I listed eight things, there are obviously more, but uh, the first six are what you'd expect. Maybe the last two are a little more interesting. Um, so lower density um, of population, we had many people working remotely, we had about half the number of students we could um, have in the dorms um, living there. Uh, we had uh, McNaughton, uh, all of you will be pleased to know as the uh, quarantine space. Um, uh, we, um, 
we implemented a comprehensive surveillance testing program and comprehensive in the sense that if you were working on campus as a student or a staff member, you were tested and you might be as tested as often as twice a week. This was a PCR saliva test. We, uh, our lab was just fantastic. We had 24 hour returns um, and it was just incredibly valuable, especially at the beginning of the second semester when we were arriving with pretty high levels of COVID um, around the country and in Oregon. Um, and it, it allowed us to very quickly isolate anybody that we uh, we found and then figure out who they had run into and isolate those people as well. Uh, you know, in aggregate, we had fewer than 40 cases um, throughout the entire year. So it's really remarkable. Um, uh, third, um, altered academic calendar, basically to make sure to, to avoid travel. So sort of a longer, uh, fall semester, then everybody goes home and finishes the semester online um, and sort of a similar idea in the spring, although the seniors stuck around. Um, uh, fourth, um, you, you know, there just weren't any gatherings uh, throughout the year other than and classes. Um, and so that's a very strange kind of way to operate, um, of course. Um, uh, fifth, virtually no travel. Um, you know, uh, I'm a person who travels a great deal for Reed, and all of us didn't do that. We didn't have events. Um, it ended up saving a lot of money, but um, it, it really did impact operations. Um, the tents were a uh, major investment. Um, they were, you know, one that not every college could do because of uh, the climate they're in, but we did, and we had you know, I think some of you remember November's not uh, warm. So, you know, but people were committed to, to that space and, and quite enjoyed them. There were some complications as you can imagine uh, in the bad weather. Maybe the most interesting uh, things though, um, we were under a whole new regulatory regimen um, uh, by, the, by the state of Oregon, the Higher Education Coordinating Commission. Uh, it was a group that um, many of you haven't heard about and I was on the phone with them very regularly um, as they try to give guidance or regulation. Um, and to some degree, I would say this was a pretty healthy partnership and that's a, that's a nice outcome. And there were other partnerships that developed. I've mentioned our testing partner, but this was a, this was a time when partnerships mattered. And then finally, uh, we had this new cross-disciplinary committee, um, the COVID Risk Assessment Committee met every week, uh, Friday morning, sent out a communication every week. Uh, it was just a very different way of operating and I think one that we're all trying to understand what we can uh, learn from that and take forward. Um, so I, I, just those as the highlights, Caroline. And those communications went out to the student body, to all faculty, all staff, and, and to the yep. public even with um, the Reed website, uh, COVID pages, with um, a lot of detail about current actions, activities, statistics, et cetera. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, they're, they're all archived if you want to scroll through them. It's a remarkable uh, chunk of work. Yeah, yeah. So so you mentioned um, some expenses. Uh, how has the college been impacted financially during this pandemic? Yeah, it, it obviously, um, I think there were any number of colleges that um, sort of last year about this time, we're in full scale uh, fear mode uh, in terms of finances. And I think you know, we all heard stories of, of layoffs um, and, and worse, frankly. Um, and it, it, you know, one wondered, would anybody show up to, to take classes in the fall? And, um, and uh, all of us agreed very early, um, and the board was really um, instrumental here, that we were gonna prioritize offering the best educational program possible. And we'd, we'd figure out the money on the back end of it. Um, the major impacts were, um, I suppose, five. Uh, so lower enrollment, although not as much as we had worried, um, um, second, uh, lost revenue on residence halls. That was pretty significant, of course, because we chose not to fill them. Um, uh, significant spending on COVID, especially testing. Um, fourth, um, you know, we didn't really reduce our ex expenses other than things like travel and events. Um, and then finally, um, you know, sort of how does this all add up? Uh, you know, last 
uh, October, I think we were projecting that we'd be running deficits of roughly $10 million, and, but Reed's budget's about $100 million, so it's significant. Um, we're now thinking that we're, we'll come out with about a $4 million deficit this year. Um, that's due to uh, much lower spending. I'd mentioned travel and events, and there are other areas where we just didn't spend money. Um, and, um, and we did get some relief from the federal government in, in terms of uh, the kind of uh, support they gave for lots of businesses uh, to help navigate COVID. Um, so, but I'm, you know, I think that prioritizing sort of our basics, you know, the academic program, financial aid for students at the very outset was a really a great decision um, and, uh, and, and, and we're, we're okay at this point. Nicole, we did have I, guess I, I do need to say thank you, though. I heard from Mary Askelson that the annual fund is looking really good this year, and that is an incredibly good thing right now. Um, uh, donors really have stepped up in, uh, in, in wonderful ways throughout this um, to, to help the college get through it. And so thanks to all, to all of you for that. I was just about to mention, we, we did have some wonderful uh, donor support that was specifically for relief for students and kind of geared towards, especially during those initial crisis times where we just didn't know where things were going. Yeah. Um, and now overall um, uh, maintaining that, that um, support for the college to help get through and, and succeed and beyond, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this was a year when um, having some financial security made uh, decision-making uh, it wasn't any easier, but you could really make really good decisions. More options, yeah. Okay, Audrey, I'm gonna turn it to you. Uh, everything we've just heard, it, it really sounds like it's been a successful year, all things considered. Um, and why, why do you think that's happened? What's your perspective on this? Thanks, Darlene. And, you know, I would say you know, coming out where we are, it, it has been a success. And I attribute that to the way that people came together, the way that we figured things out, the way that, that we, we really benefited from a culture of care. And so, you know, when we were um, at about this point last year, one of the biggest questions that we were getting asked was, how how can you bring students back to campus? And you know they're they're at an age where we can't really trust them not to you know gather together without masks. And and the, you know in many ways what we thought last summer was that the students were a wild card variable. Now I'll say to those of us who know our Reed students, we believed deeply that the students would exhibit the kind of care for one another and for the community that they in fact did. But you know the reports from other campuses. You know even as, as we were getting underway, uh, there would be you know a party with 200 people and a super spreader event here and you know and we just it it didn't happen like that at Reed. And what was clear is that the students understood as did we all that the being on campus was something that required uh, uh, attention and vigilance and what we also came to realize as the pandemic went along was that the, there were things under our control. You know, wear a mask, practice social distancing, that protects yourself and it protects those around you. And um, people really uh, did, just did this. And you know, I, this, the footage of the students at commencement uh, brings me to tears. It was as it as it must have seemed to those of you who were able to see it. And if you can watch the whole video is online, if you want, you can see it. But um, there was just, you know, the spirit of gratitude. That was another thing that that really permeated the campus. And you know, early in the semester when we got started, I pointed out just how many staff and faculty had worked all summer long to get everything ready and students as well, so that that we could be back together and just said, you know, I'm going around thanking people. And it was it was a sort of feature of campus this year that there were unsolicited expressions of thanks and uh, nowhere more so than at commencement. You know, every student was uh, filled with thanks as they as they accepted their their diplomas. And, and I just, you know, felt um, you know, overjoyed by that. And so I would say that there there were features of the Reed campus that and of, of our community and how we um, 
are considerate of one another that that gave me confidence from the very beginning that we would we would come through this and that we would come through it in many ways stronger than before because because we've been tested by something that was invisible and scary and unknown. And, and we, we really uh, managed to, to get through this. As, as Carnell was saying, there, there certainly were points when for all of us, we were saying, what, what next? You know, the fires, which just as we, as we got students back on campus, forced everyone to be uh, pretty much back in their rooms and online entirely for about a week because the air quality was so bad. Or um, in, um, on Valentine's Day weekend, we had the only snowstorm of the, of the year and it was snow and ice and it, it, um, it wreaked havoc uh, on, 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 on campus uh, in many ways. You know, the way that, that our incredible staff come together was no more, nowhere more evident than uh, the, the rapid response when an uh, alarm um, let us know that, that the two gym roofs were on the verge of, of, of collapse. Mm -hmm. No one was inside, no one was injured. There were people who were there ready to respond to this incident. Um, and, you know, an injury on top of injury, um, that, that, that one is hard for us. Um, and you know, the, the question that you asked Arlene about the financial impacts, mm -hmm. we, have to, we, have to, we have to build two gyms now. Or, or replace those gym spaces. And that was not on the agenda at the beginning of the year. And so, you know, I guess I would say that, yes, this has been, it's, we're coming out triumphant. And the, the optimism that I, I felt, even in some of the darkest hours of, of this past year, I feel even more as I, as I look to the horizon, because the energy that brought us together um, is now energy that we can put toward thinking about the really bright future up ahead for the college. And I feel great, a great sense that, that, that Reed will continue to distinguish itself, that we will continue to attract amazing students, brilliant faculty, talented staff, um, and, and, and come together. I want to also um, thank uh, alumni for their support during this time. As he was saying, the, the, um, the support for the annual fund be, you know, it becomes very critical when we have expenses in unexpected places um, to be able to uh, be nimble and, and be able to um, you know, bring resources to where we need them. And we're incredibly grateful that, that our alumni um, have, have been supportive of the college and really understand that in, in times of need, um, that's, that's when, that's when we, we are most are, are most grateful to everybody for their support. So thank you all so very much. Thank you. Caring for this spirit of enhanced community and resilience and gratitude is one of the things to, to come out of this and move forwards. Um, and certainly our alumni, um, you know, the fact they're here listening and reaching back to the college and experiencing those virtual reunions and having that community connection, um, hopefully uh, reaching out more folks who would otherwise be able to travel to campus. It's really fantastic. So thank you, Audrey. Uh, we're going to have now a few questions from the audience. And I'm going to switch gears to look at my other screen and we'll get through as many as we can. All right. A uh, question. Um, maybe this is for, I don't know, this could be for anyone. Uh, what is next year's entering class looking like in terms of home state, country of origin, grades, need for financial aid? Do we know some of those demographics of um, what's the entering class uh, for Reed coming up? I'm going to start off just by saying that we have had a, a really a great response in terms of acceptances of our of our invitation to join Reed uh, over. Five, I think over 550 students said yes to us. We know that this summer is going to be really weird in terms of what we call melt. Um, it's going to, this is a stranger year because it, it's been a strange year for colleges around the country. Now, um, I, I have to say, uh, 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 Kathy Hugh Carnell, I wasn't able to pull up the, the demographic specifics. If anybody has a document that, that they can draw on, what, what I will say is that, you know, there, 
in terms of the the um, academic profiles of our students, you're quite strong as as you would expect, and we haven't seen any any diminishment in terms of the the, the quality of the students that we're we're bringing in. Great. Any other thoughts or comments on this question? You know, I'm I'm looking at the report. It's such a swirl right now. Quite yeah. honestly, um, there is. Um, a lot of change um, for a bunch of complicated reasons um, with entering classes at this point, but we will make sure to update everybody. Um, it's a, you know, our the quick version would be, this is a, a wide ranging class um, and really talented. So it sounds like it'll be full capacity in terms of a, a full class. Okay. Uh, yeah. Question about living, um, on-campus living, off campus, um, what do you think might be the, um, the scenario for the fall coming up? Yes, you know, I, I think one of the things that we've, that was really interesting this year is you know, a lot of our students were in single rooms this year. And so as we go into uh, the fall, students will have roommates again. And so we know that, that that actually is really helpful. I think a lot of our students this year were like, we wish we had a roommate, you know, we and, and that actually contributed a bit to, you know, mental health as well. And so I, I think our students, um, we will see, we will be full capacity. We're, we're excited about mm -hmm. that. I think the campus is going to be even more livelier. Um, and what's really, I think, really interesting about, uh, about having a more livelier campus for our first year students who just experienced this this past year, and even our sophomore students who had kind of had the disruption in their first, their first semester, they're going to also get the chance to partake in kind of a start over in a sense of what it's like to be on campus from day one all the way until, you know, the, the last day of class of the academic year. So we're looking forward to, to having um, more students on campus um, and are ready for it. We're thinking about programming already. We're thinking about um, how we want to engage them in, in, in activities and how we want to build their individual communities. Um, some folks may know this or may not know this, but we have what we call a neighborhood model. And so our first year students are together, our sophomore students are together, our upper division students are together. And so it gives them an opportunity to create community specifically related to their, their class. So this is a really housing like, model, Carnell? Mm -hmm. okay. It is a, mm -hmm. our housing model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I think is really helpful, especially as it relates to helping our students feel like they have a, a sense of belonging and a sense of community here. And, and that's that's really great. Yeah. So this touches on another question about support for students, mental health support, care. Um, you just mentioned people were in singles uh, who were on campus looking forward to having a roommate. Um, you know, are there other um, things you, you, you want to say about that level of support this past yeah. year, lessons learned or uh, what was successful and then going forwards into yes. this new year? Yes, you, you know, one of the things that, you know, at, at many campuses, you know, folks relegate the support for mental health for students to, to counseling centers typically. Mm -hmm. And yes, our counseling center was a guide and, and a driving force around that. But mm -hmm. one of the things this past year is that our faculty members, our staff members really stepped up in ways that I think helped us really keep tabs on, on, on our students in a way to make sure that they had support. Um, so this past year, we have uh, we had a group of uh, folks from across the college. We called them the Reed Care Team. So Audrey's talking about the culture of care, and this is a culture of care at the heart of it, um, where faculty members could actually share that you know a student is struggling in particular ways, and then folks in the student life team would actually intervene and say, okay, we hear you're struggling with academics, or we hear you're struggling with some financial things, or we hear you're struggling in these different places, and we were able to connect with the students to give them some support and resources before things actually ever became a, you know, a major issue. Um, and the other great piece of this too is that our, our counseling staff, I mean, we they rocked it this year. So everything from providing additional support just um, in, the, in the terms of counseling support and services, but we also took a more holistic approach too, because we knew it wasn't just about you know the the emotional state, but also the physical state of our students. So our 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 athletics um, and and fitness folks were really about how do we make sure that our students are you know getting are being active and staying active. Um, so 
if you would drive by campus, you could probably see Tai Chi happening on the on the lawn. Um, it happened quite regularly. I was like, I want to join in on, on these um, to um, students just engaging outside in the outdoors, uh, especially during the, the, the better, better months when it was was nice out. Yeah. And the uh, loss of the gym being uh -huh. a very significant mm -hmm. impact. On that, um, on, on physical and, well yeah. and we had even virtual, we mm -hmm. had virtual programming for for ways for students to engage physically as well. So mm -hmm. we we again, we took a whole more holistic approach, um, but also had opportunities for interventions to happen when students really struggled um, mm -hmm. this past year. And I think it was also important to note that. We tell students, you know, if you need to pause for a second, it is okay. Like we know that sometimes it may be a lot. And again, just I mentioned at the very beginning, that there was so much going on this past year, um, and it's also really it was really great for students to also recognize where their limits were when it came to to self regulating in a sense yeah. um, connected to to their experience and what they were trying to manage and navigate. Yeah. Good. Good. Kathy, we have a really interesting question. Um, perhaps you know, have you heard about any student who's working on a thesis that could be related to the pandemic um, or, or other course of study uh, related to the pandemic? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I actually, this year I was on um, seven psychology theses. So I was like, I'm going to get back and kind of doing the faculty thing. There was one of the theses um, uh, Jessica, a student in psychology, and she actually looked at the COVID risk assessment group, kind of the things that the campus was doing to sort of have to lower risk. So actually did surveys of faculty, staff, and students about what were the things, kind of their assessment of the different kinds of things that were happening. So um, as we talked about earlier, I think, um, again, I do not have the data in front of me, so I may not have all the details, but she found actually the Kind of the weekly messages those were something that was really that were really effective so that just that we know we're going to find it every week we kind of know what's going on but again her analysis was trying to look at what were the things that people perceived as being effective in that context mm -hmm. um i'm trying to think if there was other things I mean, there was another um another student in psychology so again the ones i'm thinking of were, were orals that i was on in psychology but one student was looking at um student academic achievement. So looking at kind of um, Jennifer Corpus has this great data set that looks at students across time. And so these are students who had started a few years ago and kind of looking at um, basically their motivation, were they intrinsically motivated or extrinsically motivated? And she looked at kind of folks in COVID, students in COVID um, had quantitative data, also did qualitative interviews and then compared them to students who weren't um, students during during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it was an opportunity to actually look at, some, you know, kind of assess some of the things that we were doing and also look at what were maybe some of the uh, pros and cons of being in the situation, looking at kind of just standard kind of academic motivation and those kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I actually um, was able to uh, see the uh, and talk with with the advisor to the student Jessica who wrote okay. on the response. And one of the things that she highlighted was that the the students were uh, the, the one of the things that inspired the most confidence was the testing. Yeah. And so you know, uh, Hugh, yeah. I know that that was it was a it was a cliffhanger, and it was uh, it was certainly one of our largest expenses in terms of our response. And you know, I think for many, uh, myself included, it, it really helped us feel. A sense of, of security to be able to do that kind of surveillance testing, and very few, uh, very few places that were open um, were, were actually doing testing as regularly as we were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, to be continued in the in the Reed Alumni Magazine. If there's any other uh, student work coming out of this, specific to the pandemic, I'm sure we'll hear about it. Um, question for everyone, what are some of your concerns going into this next academic year? I think it's the primary concerns. Um, and, you know, concern may not be um, necessarily foreshadowing, but uh, just what are you thinking about? What are you focused on as kind of your priority focus going into this year? I guess I, I will start. Mine is always centered about the students. So if, if the, my, my, my sense um, of things and kind of what my what probably my biggest concern be is that helping students understand and navigate this this a new reality um, and um, helping them to to understand some of the the complexities and and I feel like again as I thought as I as I shared you know students stress levels were really high this past year like in in and so how do we help them 
kind of reduce those stress levels going into the new year and 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 help them be ready to to tackle you know their their educational experience in a in a even meaningful more meaningful way um and so i think for me the, again the, i think the big concern is more about how we help them transition post pandemic um, how do they take what they've learned and in, in, in the resilience that they've developed and things of that nature and how do they apply that to to the now um, and um, also just how to be in community together again like you know as I said we've been on zoom most of the time so what does that look like how do we have dialogue how do we have you know when dissenting conversations are happening how do we do that um, we, we haven't been able to do it for a while yeah are there specific benefits to having the housing? being by class year that that you've seen because that isn't new as to this year that's been um mm -hmm. we've had some right. experience and, with and, that coming up to those mm -hmm. right and one of the things you know we did a whole study around this and one of the biggest things is that um students who were you know first year students versus and and seniors who were living next to each other they were just they're experiencing different things at that at their particular time of whether it be courses or whatnot and I think one of the um, one of the big benefits of this is that they are able to develop a cohort of sorts, and we know that the cohort type of experience is actually one that actually yields a lot of more results when it comes to retention, when it comes to building community and connecting with with with, with each other, and then also the types of programming developmentally, the types of programming will look different in the residence halls for first-year students than it will be for our seniors. So we were able to more tailor particular programming, the types of events, the activities that are happening, the types of conversations we would be having with, with first years. They were able to see themselves collectively in the, in the same situation so that they could say, oh, we can do this. You know, I see my friend doing this. Oh, we can do it too. Um, so it, it gets a, a bit of that positive psychology that's in, that gets in the mix of there as well. Now, I, maybe we, if you, if you throw this out, we're running short on time, but uh, we do have a great question. Another anecdote, maybe what's the readiest thing that you've seen this past year that still has that shenanigan feel uh, that we heard about in the video um, that you might have seen on campus or heard about. Well, we did get to see the some of the clips from um, the thesis burning, and you know, keep in mind, you know, this this um, my experience in my first year was truncated. So uh, you know, this it was uh, I think for all of us it was it was really joyful to be able to see that that and um, that is quite reedy as is the wearing of the laurels. You know, those are, those are two. Things that that students wearing their laurels, um, uh, uh, you know, leading up to commencement, really special. Yeah. You know, I, I I think shenanigans happen outside the view of this group. Maybe um, is one thing um, we might notice. But you know, there are just two sweet things I'll comment on. So the testing center um, was this funny thing. You'd go and you'd spit in a tube, right? It's which and and. Um, but what I noticed the students would do is they would talk to these um, folks that we hired to administer the testing. And these talks were fascinating. What are you listening to? Uh, what are you reading? Um, and it's just a really, you know, the, the curiosity of the community came through. The second thing is we bought, I, uh, Mandy Heaton, who's on this chat, bought, I don't know, 20 plastic red Adirondack chairs because we had to take the picnic tables. And, and those chairs would wander around the campus and you would see them in little groups here and little groups over there. And it was, you could like, that's where you'd see the community happening when we weren't looking. Um, so it, it, you know, I don't know, it, those struck me anyway. <laughs> Great. Well, we're, we're about closing up because we do have another event happening uh, starting in just a minute. I wanna thank everyone panelists for your participation. Thanks for everyone in the audience uh, and excellent questions.